was really quite upset. She explained to the minister that uh, she was troubled in the fact that she she knew she was supposed to love the Lord. She tried very hard to love Jesus, but she just didn't feel towards him like, like she felt towards her mom or her dad or anybody else that she loved. No matter how she tried to kindle that love in her for him, it seemed like it just wasn't working for her. And she was very distressed about why she couldn't love Jesus. The minister smiled to her and very gently said, you know, dear, you need to stop concentrating on trying to love Jesus. And you need to think more about how much Jesus loves you and how he shows you his love in your life. She says, the whole next day, I want you to keep telling yourself over and over again in your life, Jesus loves me. You come back here tomorrow and you talk to me. Well, the next day when the girl came into his office, he didn't even ask, have to ask her about how she was doing. She came in with a big smile on her face, and he could tell just right there that she wasn't having that problem any longer. The more she had concentrated on the love that Jesus had for her, the less it became an issue about loving him, the easier it became to love him. I want to say that principle is a solid one for our lives as well. Responding to God's love, recognizing God's love in our life, helps us to love Him sincerely. It's going to be very hard for us to focus enough of our energy to love God when we're only thinking about on our side. But when we constantly see God's love being applied to our lives, it's the easiest thing in the world to love Him. But of course, for that to work, we need to know that He does love us. And here's the real problem that we have, living in the world that we live in today. How can we be sure that God loves us? How are we supposed to know of God's love when he allows some things into our lives that are so very difficult for us? When he lets us down so often? Should we think that he loves us when he allows these terrible things to happen in our lives? When we think that our mother loved us and she was constantly trying to shove us out into traffic? Are we to worship him? Are we to praise him? Are we to adore him? But how is that even possible in the midst of our suffering? This morning, perhaps the prayer song of the prophet Habakkuk can help us find an answer. Our text for this morning is Habakkuk 3, verses 18 and 19, where we see these words. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Our passage reminds us that life can be quite brutal and sometimes is. Look at the conditions that are depicted here in this, in this passage. No figs, no grapes, no olives, no grain, no sheep, no cattle. In this region, at this time, that speaks of an absolute devastation of a famine. Everything that they could raise or grow for themselves has failed. And they find themselves with nothing to eat. And what's more, this is an agricultural culture. There is very little business outside agriculture which is being done in the nation at this time. So if you're talking about every crop failing, no produce, no flocks, no herds, you're talking about the whole country's economy being wiped out as well. You hear your children crying because they don't have anything to eat. And you know that you can't even find a morsel to satisfy them. To endure 
days of starvation with no hope that tomorrow is going to be any different. It's going to be another day of deprivation again as you feel yourself getting weaker. It's harsh conditions we're talking about. You remember the biblical account about the siege of Samaria? The enemy, Aram, had come against Samaria and had walled it in the walled about the city so that they could not go in or out. And because of that, soon the food supply within the city began to be exhausted. You remember what it was like in the city at that time? When the food had all run out, we're told that a donkey's head was selling for 80 silver shekels in the city's gates. And a half pint of dove's dung was selling for five silver shekels. That's right. They were scraping the bird droppings off the walls and off the pavement and selling it for human consumption. That's how bad it was inside the city at this time. People were starving. They'd been reduced to such a state by that that horrible things started happening in the city. We're told of at least one incident, and it may have been in many cases, that parents conspired to put their children to death so that they might eat their children. We're talking about cannibalism here, not just cannibalism of those who had already died, but cannibalism of their own living children. That's how depraved it was in the city when there was nothing to eat. Those are the same type of extreme conditions that the prophet is proposing here in this psalm. He's talking about everything being taken away and having no resources at all and people finding themselves in that desperate condition. We might never experience that kind of condition ourselves, but we can identify <clears throat> going through periods where we feel extreme loss. Times when we don't know how we can possibly cope. We've seen famines and fires and floods in our nation. We've seen times when the bills overwhelm us and when our resources are long exhausted as how we're going to pay those bills. We've been backstabbed by friends. We've seen the one who promised till death do us part walk away long before their expiration date. Sudden injury, declining health might strike our bodies. We might see tragic loss of those that we love. As believers, even though we are God's own dear children, we are immune to that kind of suffering. We are immune to that kind of loss. These things happen to us. These dark passages we go through as well. Job, who God delighted in, <coughs> suffered mightily. He lost his family. He lost his money. He lost everything, his health. He felt lost in the extreme. The Apostle Paul, after he was converted, he entered into probably the greatest season of suffering in his life. Before he came to Christ, when he was a sanctimonious Pharisee, he seemed to be doing pretty well. But after he came to Christ, he knew times of great want. He knew times when he was beaten and thrown into prison and when everybody turned their backs on him. He knew a whole lot more suffering in Christ than he knew outside Christ. I want to tell you this morning, don't listen to those people who tell you that once you come to Christ, if you're a faithful believer, everything's going to go right for you. That God's not going to allow anything bad to happen to you in this world because it's not biblical and it's certainly not true in what we see in our own lives. No matter how much you try to live for the Lord, you're going to find those times when things are painful, when things are hard, when everything seems to be going wrong, and when you're not sure how you're going to make it through. This present day. This world is a place of trials and a place often of suffering. And our relationship with God doesn't remove us from that loss in our lives. It only changes how we respond to the suffering. 
Many people are going to be disappointed when they find out that their relationship with the Lord doesn't give them immunity. They will rail of God, they're going to turn away from Him as if their suffering proves that He's unjust or indifferent to them. They're going to look at it as God being unfaithful or uncaring in their lives. But His promise is to be with us, to give us strength and comfort. He never promised to wrap us in bubble wrap or to hold an umbrella over our heads. He never promised that we wouldn't have to go through the difficulty, only that He would be at our side when we did. No one emerges from this world unscathed. You might not see the trials and struggles that somebody else is going through. You might think that person sitting next to you in the view is living a charmed life right now, but that's only because you can't see all the issues that are going on in their lives. Or you'd understand that they too have some very dark passages that they've had to go through and may even be going through right at this present moment. Every one of us suffers pain in this world. And it has been that way since man introduced sin into the mixture. Right from the garden, it's been that way in our existence that this world is filled with pain and loss and suffering. All creation groans under the fall. Our world is saturated with evil since man entered into sin. And even the natural world has been corrupted by the entrance of sin into it. There's a disruption of nature as God created it to be. And it is lesser because of man's sin. There was no bad weather. There was no illness. There was no conflict in relationships. No loss of death. By death in the garden. That God designed. All of this came about after God's design was disrupted by man's sin. Thorns grew. Weather, weather patterns became severe. Man's existence could only be sustained through his sweat. Woman experienced pain with the creation of new life in her. Everything changed. And everyone in this environment experiences the consequences of a tainted world. You know, bad things happen. Horrible things happen. Life is sometimes brutal. I want you to see the other thing in us, our passage this morning, and that's this. We must still lift God up. Our passage says, Yet I will exalt in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. We need to lift God up because He is worthy. The day might be beautiful. Finding you sitting on a hill with a gentle breeze blowing on your face as you watch the sun sink floor on the horizon and the crimson tones creep into the sky. <coughs> the day might be horrific, with the skies of dark purple pelting you with hailstones as a tornado approaches. But regardless, God is the same. He is perfect. He is without any sin, changing his judgment. Nothing affects his judgment. His pure love radiates out on us, even in the hardest of circumstances. Are we to despise God because we're experiencing something awful? I want to tell you this morning that a good mother loves her child just as much when she's insisting that he eat the vegetables that are healthy for him as she does when she's dishing out ice cream for him. She cares just as much for her child when she's disciplining him as when she's expressing appreciation. A child who despises his loving mother because she acts with consistent love in actions sometimes that are painful to him shows himself to fail in that relationship, not his mother. God is absolutely good all the time, and it is our failure, not his, when we don't want to respond to him in love, regardless of what we're going through. After the sudden illness, the father and his little daughter buried his wife, her mother. 
the woman who had been at the heart of their home. They went home that evening from the funeral home to a house that seemed empty, broken-hearted. They returned to a place that was dark and comfortless. Nothing seemed to be the same. Nor did it look like it was ever going to be like it was before. That night, a sad father tucked in his sad little girl, kissed her, tried to give her assurance that everything was going to be okay. And then he turned off the light as he exited the room. He went to his own bedroom, thinking that he wasn't going to be able to sleep much that night himself. When he heard the little voice from down the hall saying, Daddy, it's so dark. Just a few seconds later, he heard a quiet little voice again. Daddy, you love through the dark, don't you? Brothers and sisters, our God loves through the dark. Our God loves us through the worst of times. Our God loves us when pain overwhelms and everything seems to be going wrong. The preacher asked the bride, will you love in sickness and in health, in poverty and wealth? Will you love uh, for better or for worse? And the bride responds, I'll take in health better and richer. <laughs> A marriage can't exist on that basis, can it? Love isn't love, but only responds when everything's going well. God is worthy of our praise and adoration in every circumstance. He calls us to be faithful, not fair weather believers. He calls us to love him even in the hard times. We must still lift God up because he is worthy. And we must still lift God up because we need to see and acknowledge him in the worst of times. Not just a matter of God being worthy. It's also about our need. We were made to be with God, not as equals, but we were made to be with Him. We were made to respond to Him as the child relates to the Father, as the creature relates to the Creator, as the rescued relates to the rescuer, as the one who sees worth and appreciates it, but cannot attain it to themselves, to the one who is altogether perfect all the time. We fit when we know him and strive to be as he created us to be. Happiness and contentment don't come when we want to have things our way all the time. It comes when we appreciate his worth regardless of our condition. I want to ask you this morning, what is the best way to deal with the brutal things that come into our lives? Is to focus on his goodness and to exalt him. Yes, that's the best way we have of dealing with pain and suffering in our lives. To recognize his goodness and to praise our God. Denial doesn't help Angry accusations don't make things better. Only seeing that our God is worthy and acknowledging it gives us a basis for coping with the hard times that come our way. So we can say it's not just because God's worthy, but because we absolutely need to. That we must turn to God and recognize his goodness. That's what enabled Paul to say of the trials and tribulations coming upon the church, that it was momentary light affliction. Not because they were not suffering unto death, not because they were not being tortured, deprived, having the children taken away from them, having the property removed from them. These horrible things were happening to the church, but it was momentary and light because Paul recognized God's goodness and knew eventually God would triumph. The truly believer needs to be able to say, along with God's prophet, 
Worst comes to worst, no matter how I'm affected, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. We sang that song, echoing that familiar, a refrain of Christian fellowship that many churches use week after week in their fellowship there. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. I say to you this morning, let's rejoice in Him in every season. Someday we will attain to that place where there is no suffering. Someday we will enter into that place where He shall wipe away every tear and we're never going to have to worry about hardships and deprivation and broken hearts again. But until then, let us always see and acknowledge the greatness of our God. God's love is seen clearest of all for us on Calvary. He put it on display there saying, I love you so much that I give my own son your sake. He gave his son that we might experience the very best, even in the worst of times. That really brings us to our invitation time this morning. Will you see and respond to God's goodness? Will you acknowledge that your God is bigger and greater than the things that are going wrong in your life right now? Will you turn to him as the one who can give comfort and offers a place where there is no despair and no sorrow? This morning, if you want to make that decision, or if you have another decision you make publicly, we invite you to come forward. Our invitation song is going to be, Blessed be your name, let's stand and sing this together. Thank mm-hmm. you.